it's on cancer. How does cancer arise? You may have heard that the prevailing theory is that it's caused by a number of mutations, the so-called mutation theory. But we have, studying it, run into more and more difficulties with it and come up with essentially a new old theory that is actually karyotypic, very much like the evolution of species, exactly like the evolution of species almost, except that it doesn't make it all the way to autonomy like we and the other species that Darwin or God or somebody in between has created. And we don't know how. Yeah. It's not so clear. With cancer, we do know how. We can actually test it. It's a chromosomal evolution process. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. Now, briefly, for those of you who are, or all of you who are in this, the cancers contain individual clonal karyotypes, much like normal phylogenetic species. They have not a normal karyotype with mutation, as the mutation theory suggests, they have their own karyotypes with their own chromosome numbers, everything. The karyotypes of cancer differ from normal cells, diploid cells, in cancer-specific abnormal, as you would call relative to the normal cell, or aneuploid is the technical term, meaning it's a Greek, whatever derivative term, not the right ploidy, not the right folding, but the right number of chromosomes and structures. And here are two examples. On the left is the, the pinnacle of evolution. That's the human male with <laughs> 23 chromosomes. Uh, here, uh, diploid chromosomes. And this is by so-called MFISH. You color code these chromosomes. It makes it much easier to do cytogenetic analysis. You spread the chromosomes on an object, uh, on a microscope slide, and then hybridize them with color-specific probes and they all assume these artificial colors. So this is chromosome 1, 2, 3, all the way to 22, and here's X and Y, one each. So that's a normal human male, 46 chromosomes. And here is one uh, particular cancer cell, a karyotype of a colon cancer cell, cell line. It's very stable, in fact, not quite as stable as, as normal karyotypes are. But you can see the numbers are drastically changed. And here's a gallery of so-called creeps, almost so-called marker chromosomes that are hybrids of these chromosomes. You can tell from the colors. This is a hybrid of 6 and 1. This is a hybrid of 13. Some 13 marker. This is a, when the two, with two colors, you could say 17, 22, and 17. They're triple hybrids with markers. That is the hallmark of cancer cells. When that happens in us normally, then things are very bad. You, you would hardly ever be born with any of these changes. Only as a cancer cell are you born, which is a sort of a new species. Here are two more examples. That is a breast cancer. Not a good one, as you can see. Lots of marker chromosomes, abnormal cells, breast cancer life. And as I said, everybody's cancer is individual. They are, all have their own karyotypes. Again, like species. And here is a karyotype of a muscle cancer uh, that is simpler than the two others that are highly, more highly de developed. So can the, in contrast to the karyotypes of normal species, you can already see from these patterns, the karyotypes and phenotypes of cancers are flexible. I don't like to use the word unstable because unstable means they would fall apart. But they oscillate in a narrow range like a wave, a, ra a radiation wave for, would, in, in physics. And, the, uh, and they are flexible in, in these limits, and thus able to evolve ever more malignant phenotypes spontaneously. That is the daunting property of cancers. It starts bad, but it typically gets worse because it's so flexible. The evolution uh, occurs very fast compared to Darwinian evolution. You have to wait for every step 10 million years. This explains the daunting ability of cancers to go from bad to worse, as Peyton Raus used to call it which is also termed now cancer progression. You start off with a manageable cancer that gets more and more drug resistant, metastatic, and unpredictable. As a result of this inherent inflexibility, the karyotypes of cancers are typically also heterogeneous, and so are the phenotypes, but again within limits. Now, this is a different way of looking at the instability it's sort of a thing that is in, in Excel. A student of mine found, figured it out. 
you can line up three-dimensionally the, uh, the metaphases or the chromosomes of 20 cells in the, the x axis and they call it the karyograph. The x axis here, down there, are the chromosome numbers of a given cell. So here's chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And this, you can see already, is a male cell, a normal male cell. We have two. Here's the, uh, in the y axis is the chromosome copy number. There are two because it's diploid. And in men, there's one only. It's haploid, or if you like, or monosomic of the X and Y chromosomes. There are two of those here. All others are double. And in, so these are um, images of or, or essentially different cells. There are 20 usually lined up and next to each other. And you can see three-dimensionally that they're completely parallel, meaning that their karyotypes are identical and very stable. If you look with the same instrument, with the same diagram at a cancer cell, this one is a breast cancer, another breast cancer line, you can see now that it is a completely different karyotype graphically. It isn't no longer the smooth parallel lines of a normal cell. They go up and down. They have a new karyotype. Uh, in, you see the copy number here of the majority is three, then it goes down to one. Here it's up to four. Here it's even five. And you can see the lines are no longer totally parallel, but they oscillate around this pattern. And this pattern is actually remarkably stable. It's a, it's a stability within instability. That is characteristic of the cancer. If, even if you passage this cancer 60 generations in culture or put it through an animal and isolate it again, it will look more or less the same. Unless you put on some strong selective pressure like drug selection, so then it changes the karyotype, which the cancer cell can do, normal cell never does. When you have chemotherapy, it's the cancer that becomes persistent and you never do. So as a specific, uh, as a result of this inflexibility, the karyotypes of cancer and the resulting tumors are heterogeneous and it is therefore still debated and has been debated for nearly 100 years now, ever since Boveri first suggested chromosomal abrasions are causes of cancer and subsequently the majority of geneticists favored the view that it's mutations. It is still debated whether, because of whether flexible, but rather specific karyotypes, as I just showed to you, or whether stable and specific mutations are the causes of cancer hidden that we not don't see, or the so-called oncogenes now, that would, as a consequence of their presence, cause cancer and also destabilize the karyotype. So the, the destabilized karyotype is recognized even by the mutation people, although you can hardly find it in modern textbooks anymore. You don't see a karyotype anymore. Everything is expressed in genes or in gene arrays. The karyotype is considered something for little old ladies or people of the uh, last generation are looking through a microscope and work on a low budget. But uh, for, the, for the real advanced uh, uh, cytogenetic cancer researcher, you have a gene array for $1,000 a piece and show a diagram with thousands of little spots to interpret for the surgeon whether the right breast or the left breast or lymph node should be taken out or not. That's what they really say at the end. I don't know how they see it, but they do see a lot, I guess. So this is still uh, the question that has, has not been settled in 100 years of debate. Is it chromosomes or is it mutations that are causing cancer? And we are solving it right now. Next 15 minutes, that's what we have. Oh, no, no more. <laughs> so, so, so the mutation theory holds that a set of six to three to six mutations of specific genes that are termed oncogenes as a result of these mutations, namely meaning that they cause cancer, transform normal cells to cancer cells independent of karyotypic alterations. They recognize grudgingly, yes, that a lot of karyotype changes, but they say this is a consequence or an accidental uh, thing because the cell is transformed. Popular proponents of the mutation theory are all of my former friends and even current friends, some of them, like Bishop and Warmus and Weinberg and, and Vogelstein, so and, and all the uh, leading cancer researchers still subscribe to the mutation theory. Mm -hmm. So, but there is 
no direct functional proof for the, for the mutation theory, despite 30 years of research and beside, despite uh, gene technology that is mar that's marvelous, you can put any gene in any cell that you want, and, uh, if you want. And they have done that with these oncogenes. They put them into normal cells, but so, as you can see, the results are at best ambiguous. If not, there's certainly no direct proof. What happened is when you take a, a, conv a convenient or whatever they call it, a consensus number of oncogenes that is said to be or thought to be sufficient for cancer, one of them published in Nature recently by Weinberg and by others, Bishop and so on, have done the same thing. They take three or four, put them into normal human cells, and then they say, see, when you wait long enough, after several months, there is a tumor cell coming up as a clone. What they don't tell you is they put millions of cells in, into this culture that all have the same oncogenes and are not transformed, out of which over months comes occasionally a clone of transformed cells. So what that means is when you get for, in, for transfecting, as that is called, millions of cells with oncogenes that are supposedly causing the cancer, you get only one in 10 to the 5 to transform. That means these genes are not sufficient to do the job. Something else is required. And that is more or less openly acknowledged. So they are not sufficient for tumor genicity. And the answer of the mainstream is we need another gene yet that we haven't found yet. But they have never found a complete set yet, although the Nobel Prize was given for this idea already in 89. So have to catch up soon to justify the Nobel Prize or the next one, whatever it is. So the oncogenes that induce transformation is another result of these experiments. In one out of 10 to the 5 cells are not necessary to maintain the transformed phenotype. They do their job transiently because tumors and leukemias induced by oncogenes persist even if the oncogenes are lost or turned off experimentally with, with experimentally controllable promoters, these TET on, TET off, they, you take tetracycline promoters and you add, give the mouse tetracycline and the gene is shut off or shut on. Once the tumor is, is established in a couple of weeks, it is no longer dependent on the oncogene. The oncogene, in other words, is not maintaining the transformed phenotype and is not sufficient to initiate it. And all cells that have been studied for karyotypes, and that's only very few who have done that, and you can imagine one of who, who did, uh, were found to be a nuploid. And that is not mentioned in Nature when that was one of the, uh, the leading papers from Weinberg came out. I even sent them the karyotypes. Isn't that interesting information at least? They said, no, no, we don't need that. It's enough that we have in there six mutations, that they have 70 chromosomes in these cells, plus the six mutations, that, count, that it is an equivalent of another roughly 20,000 genes. It's not relevant to them because they don't have any known mutations in them. So they are not taking this very serious. So what is now the role of mutations or oncogenes in cancer? The conclusions from these three kinds of experiments are oncogenes are not sufficient and are not necessary to maintain the cancer cells. So what is their role in transformation? That is the one experiment I wanted to describe today, and then I will shut up. The carrot, uh, see, here's the theory that we think uh, how it works and what it does, and the effect of how cancer is uh, generated in general. In, in efforts to explain this, we have recently proposed a two-step karyotypic cancer theory. That's, once you have seen that, then it's almost, I'm almost over. The, the first step in this process of carcinogenesis is that carcinogens and also the oncogenes, which function like carcinogens, destabilize the karyotype by inducing random aneuploidy. Some of them might also induce mutations, but that's secondary. The critical essential point for cancer is that they destabilize the karyotype. And that you see in every mm -hmm. cancer cell. And that explains at the same stroke about half of all known carcinogens that are not mutagens, like asbestos and, and uh, polystyrene and all these things. 
So once you have an aneuploid cell, the aneuploidy destabilizes the karyotype automatically, autocatalytically, by unbalancing teams of proteins that segregate and synthesize and repair chromosomes. Imagine you had the, the most balanced and physically complex apparatus is the spindle apparatus in the cell, segregating 46 chromosomes symmetrically every eight hours if it has to be. And that works 99.9% .9 accurate. If there's the slightest imbalance, if there's a little bit more of tupulin instead of clopulin or what have you, ten, or, or, in, in, or myosin or something, then this thing is out of balance and it's like you have a, lot, a, strong, a, a long leg and a short leg, you start limping and you become error prone and the, the aneuploid karyotype constantly changes itself not, uh, it, because of these many imbalances, physical imbalances in the spindle apparatus, which is a very balanced, sensitive machine, or even in the enzyme teams, the repair enzymes, for example, that, may, that fix the DNA. If you ever done NIC translation, there's a, there's a, 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 a DNA is a polymerase and a, and, a, a, and, a, and a ligase in the mix. If you change that balance a little bit, it's, it's either hydrolyzing the DNA or stops making it. If they are in the right balance, you get optimal yield, and that's, that balance is maintained by the balance of genes in the chromosomes that have been balanced for three billion years of life. Now, if you change that, if you change thousands of genes by aneuploidy, thousands of things are out of balance. In most cases, in fact, the aneuploid cell dies. It has to find an equilibrium that it can maintain to survive. So the aneuploidy destabilizes the karyotype autocatalytically and thus keeps changing the karyotype and thus initiates and maintains karyotypic evolutions. They're constantly recouped and changed because of the inherent, in, inherent instability. Most of these newly evolving karyotypes are again random aneuploidies that are functionally inferior to normal cells or even lethal, and they're gone. Occasionally, however, like playing roulette, and playing Darwin, a rare cancer-causing karyotype evolves. It's a long way from a real autonomous species that says, goodbye, mom, I'm climbing up on the tree, or flying like a bird. That's not it yet, but it's good enough to be an autonomous parasite. It can compete with normal cells from which it just arose. And these cancer-causing karyotypes are then stabilized by the inherent instability against the inherent instability of aneuploidy by selection for transforming function. So they keep, as you could saw, see on these carrier graphs that I showed earlier, they keep fluctuating or oscillating around a clonal value, but as soon as they go too far outside it, they will not replicate and not, not maintain, not be maintained as cancer cells and they will be lost. And that's a typical phenotype in, in cancers, in all of them. The more aneuploid they are, the more necrosis you get. These are dead cells that have actually karyotypically suicided. So this karyotype theory then postulates that clonal yet flexible karyotypes are the genome of, genomes of cancers, not mutations. And by genomes, mean, I mean now that part of the chromosome or the, or the gene genetic material that makes it a cancer cell. It's the karyotype as a whole, just as the karyotype as a whole makes us either a monkey or a dog or a cat or a mosquito or a human. It's not a mutation. You can mutate us as long as you want. You will never get a monkey out of it. You have to rearrange the chromosomes, or like you, let's say you were Volkswagen, you want to make a Porsche instead of a SUV. You cannot mutate the Porsche. You have to rearrange the assembly lines, and that's the equivalent of the chromosomes, and that's whatever Darwin or God or whoever was at work in speciation has done. Here is a graphic of the whole stem. Here is the normal karyotype with diploid stable cells. In step one, aneuploidy arises, induced either by a carcinogen, which I would call an aneuploidogen from a ca cancer point of view, or sometimes spontaneously by an accident. And then you have random aneuploidy randomly aneuploid karyotypes, which are unstable, and they keep changing themselves, and there are two stable endpoints only. This one is the most stable. That's where most of them end up. They end up in a coffin because sooner or later a chromosome is missing that is essential for the viability of the cell 
and it dies. And occasionally, as I said, like in roulette, that arrow is thin for that reason, you come up with a cancer cell. And that would be a cancer-specific karyotype now, a, a true model in, in, in the, indeed for evolution. And once this happens, the cancer karyotypes co continues to evolve here. It, it, it was originated in a an nucleoid pool of karyotypes. Here's the cancer cell. And now it has a certain degree of flexibility depending on the, on the karyotype and moves on over many generations. And occasionally, again, it makes, a, it makes a, a, an additional evolutionary step when it's challenged by chemotherapy. Then a drug-resistant combination comes up that differs from the parental karyotype or a tracosystem or a metastatic one comes up that again differs from the parental karyotype. It, although the basic karyotype is maintained, it is adjusted very much like we go from a monkey to a human or, back, or forward or backwards, whatever the direction is. So here's this one experiment that I was going to mention and then I totally shut up to test the cancer theory, a karyotypic theory. We have asked whether activated oncogenes that have been tested for so long, now do indeed induce new tumor genic cells with individual cancer-specific carrier times, much like new species. Moreover, we asked whether the different tumor genic cell lines arising from human cells transfect in with the same oncogenes. I said, in these experiments, you transfect millions of cells to get a few transformed clones. So, it's a very low efficiency. Would, we would predict if it's an evolution, a spontaneous evolution of a karyotype, that each of these clonal new cancers that comes out of a homogeneous pool of human cells, all transfected with the same oncogenes, would each have their own karyotype. Like, like all progeny of whatever the original mammal was, uh, has, has, uh, uh, has a karyotype that is in part still conserved in all their derivatives. And again, would have, uh, and again, like individual species evolving from the same ancestors, having individual karyotypes with it or on phenotypes. So, and the relevance of this for testing the mutation theory is that if individual tumorigenic lines from the same parental cells with the same oncogenes have individual karyotypes and phenotypes, it would follow that the oncogenes have played only an indirect role in transformation as postulated by our theory. It's the karyotype that makes it the cancer cell and the oncogene was uh, essentially like a carcinogen. It's like the, the radiation 30 years before you get the cancer from a Hiroshima or Nagasaki bomb. By contrast, the mutation theory would predict that tumorigenic cell lines with, uh, show up from these transfected cells with normal karyotypes. They don't spell it out, but they don't say it should change the karyotype. And would have the same phenotypes because the oncogenes they add are encoding these phenotypes. So indeed, we found what the karyotype theory pr uh, predicts and that will be shown on my last slide now, we found that different tumorigenic cell lines arising from human cells transfected with the same set of oncogenes have individual clonal karyotypes and phenotypes. That's essentially a, 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 a prognostic a cancer experiment here. So here you see uh, two cells or two cell lines that's just under the microscope you uh, have to look in the animal, you could probably get more different phenotypes, but you can see these cells are phenotypically, morphologically, in a petri dish, uh, quite easy to distinguish. Yet, they're generated by exactly the same oncogenes in human epithelial cells, normal <coughs> epithelial cells. So, these phenotypes cannot be so different from the same oncogene, must be something else. And here you can see what it is. It's these two karyotypes that you were, that belong to the two cells we see. They're quite different. And they came from this. These were the cells that were transfected. The oncogenes were added. They generated aneuploidy, which you could see, a random aneuploidy. Didn't show it here. 
and then you isolate clonal colonies in agar or in animals or in, by, or in petri dishes. And these are two of these clonal colonies, a very different pattern. And here's a similar example of uh, two different uh, products, again generated with the same set of oncogenes. So that brings me to my last slide. In some of our experiments, confirm the theory that the genomes of cancer cells are flexible clonal carrier types rather than specific mutations. And I thank you again for your attention. Ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.